Uh, well, hey guys, welcome Generation Church. So good to gather with you. Uh, my name is Josh Howerton, and it is such an honor uh, to be with you at your church. Um, so here, here's a little bit of my story. I'll talk about my family here in a second. Uh, by day, I'm a pastor of a church in Nashville called The Bridge. By night, I am a total and utter fanboy of Generation Church and Pastor Ryan Visconti. And so that's right, man. And so it is good to gather. Pastor Ryan Visconti is my spirit animal. And so, uh, man, it's just good to gather with you all. And uh, man, I just want to take a second and say, I hope you know uh, the incredible move of God that is happening in your church right now. Uh, I've figured out, that's right, dude. I have figured out over the years that it's possible, possible to be so familiar with something that you stop seeing it. And what is happening in your church right now, it is not normal. It's not normal. It is a supernatural move of the Spirit of God. And so, uh, dude, can we just do this? Can we take a second and celebrate the move of God in this church? But also, wait, but also, as a pastor, I figured out there's a tremendous insecurity to being a pastor because you have no idea what people think about you. So can we do this? Can we celebrate the move of God in this church? But also, can, they're not here, but they'll watch the video. Can we show Pastor Ryan and Amy Visconti what we think about them right now? Can we do that? Do it right now, man. That's right. Absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, man. Absolutely. Dude, it is just, it's seriously, it is such an honor uh, to be with you guys tonight. And if you got your Bibles, go ahead and head over to Revelation chapter 12. That's where we're going to be tonight. Uh, we, uh, at Generation here, we started a series two weeks ago called Stand Firm. Uh, about the reality of spiritual warfare and how that, that's like a real thing that's happening to us all the time and the message that I want to bring tonight it is in a very real sense this is the best message I can bring to you uh, it has become my life message for the last year uh, this has been the theme of what the Lord has been doing in me and so uh, I want to lead into this let me set this up uh, like this I've got a uh, I've got a younger brother that's three years younger than me but three times cooler than me okay you guys know how that works and uh, my brother's story is when he was in high school, Lee sort of veered off into a season uh, where he kind of got really hard into the party scene and drank a lot and sort of just kind of wandered from the Lord for a season. And then his senior year, um, he had kind of almost like a spiritual awakening uh, where the Lord began to sort of woo him back to himself by grace. And when that happened, uh, Lee reached out to me and was like, hey, bro, need your help. I really want to stop kind of this party thing that's going on in my life. Um, but I still really want to do it sometimes. Uh, will you help me? Like, if I need help, can I call you and will you help me? I was like, bro, I'll do anything for you. And so uh, there came a night, his senior year, where Lee called me and he was like, bro, I need some help. And he said, what was going on was there was a kegger. It was like a field kegger. And he just called and he said, bro, I really want to go. Like, everybody's going to be there and I really want to drink tonight and, and just do my thing, whatever. And he was like, I, I need your help. And so I was like, dude, I know exactly what we're going to do. One. We are still going to the party. Two, you're not going to drink anything. Three, we're going to have more fun than if you went and drank the entire night. And then four, meet me at Walmart. And so that's what we did. Uh, me and Lee, we drove over to Walmart. And at Walmart, we bought three things. Uh, we bought, by the way, when I tell this story, this story for the parents in the room, this story is descriptive of what we did, not prescriptive of what you should do. So let me just get that out there. We purchased three things. We purchased a jet black clothing head to toe. We purchased two hunting slingshots. And three, we purchased the largest bag of Skittles that Walmart sells. And we drove over to the party, and here's what we did. Uh, we crept through the field up to the edge of like the firelight around the keg party, and we spent the entire night um, waiting for people to become inebriated, and we shot them with Skittles the entire night. That's what we did all night. That's right. And, uh, and listen, it was amazing. We started at least one drunken brawl that night. And uh, in the middle of the night, the cops showed up in the middle of the night, busted everything. I don't have time to finish the story, but two things are very important. One, my criminal record is totally clean. I just need to get that out there. Uh, but two, there came a, a point in that night where I thought to myself, I really wish I hadn't done this. And that's the person that I want to speak to tonight. Um, I, I want to speak to you if you are here, and this is every one of you. And you can look back at a time in your life and you can say, I really wish I hadn't done that. Uh, here's what I know. Um, there's some of you in the room who hears your story. You have figured out a way to get past the pain of life. But here's what you haven't figured out. You can get past life's pain. You haven't figured out a way to get past your past. That's where you're at. 
So for instance, uh, there's some of you here tonight, and your story is you had a sexual issue uh, when you were younger, and you did something that in the moment, it just felt fun and right and you know, kind of in the moment, that kind of thing. Uh, but then it's brought baggage into the rest of your life, and you can't seem to get past it. Um, there's some people in the room who your story is you've got a recurring sin in your life, and you haven't failed a thousand times. You've failed a thousand times a thousand times. And every time you fail, you do the same thing. Oh God, I'll never do this again. You make all the promises and you make it two or three weeks and then you fail again. And here's your entire life story. You're always carrying around the weight of your most recent failure. You can't get past your past. Some of you, uh, you're in my season, your parents with young kids are in that car seat phase. And you had that spot where recently like you just snapped and, and you lost your temper. By the way, every now and then I'll meet a Christian who says, oh, pastor, I have never cussed. That's because you've never put in a car seat. You just give yourself a time, you give yourself some time, it's gonna happen, that's gonna happen. And, and that's some of you right now, is your story is there's a spot in your life where you lost it and you said something to one of your kids that you now can't unsay. And you carry that around wherever you go. Let me get really personal for a second. There's some people here who hears your story. Years ago, you strayed in your marriage. And what's happened since then is God has forgiven you. And your spouse has forgiven you. You can't forgive you. And you can't seem to get past your past. Let me say one last thing. There's some older parents in the room. And here's your story, the pain of older parents. You've got kids in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. And here's your story. You look at all of your kids' failures right now in life and their pains, and every time you see it, what your heart thinks is, if I had just parented you better, you wouldn't be having these issues. You see, this is your story. You've been able to get past the pain. You can't get past your past. Now, if you're here and you don't resonate with anything I just said, I know something about you. You're very young. (laughs) <laughs> That's it. You're very young. So let me just make a promise to you. Every person in this room at some point in your life, you are going to do something that is so bad that it creates baggage and you can't seem to get past it. You may go, man, pastor, can't you be more positive? Yes, I can. I'm positive that at some point you're going to do something so bad that it creates baggage and you just can't seem to get past it. So that's what I want to do. I want to ask two questions tonight. I want to ask, why is that happening? What's going on? And then how do we get past it? Okay, so we've got your Bibles. Head over to Revelation 12. Pick up with me in verse 7 of Revelation 12. While you're turning there, let me just give you a little heads up about how to read the book of Revelation. It's been really helpful to me. A lot of people think the book of Revelation is all revelation about what is going to happen in the future. And that is what a lot of the book of Revelation is. But most of the book of Revelation isn't revelation about the future. It's revelation about what's going on behind the scenes in the world now in the spiritual realm. That's what we are getting ready to read. This text talks about that, okay? So pick up with me in verse 7. Let's read it and let's get in. Okay, here we go. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the, now listen, listen, for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down and they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death, okay? Now here, let me teach really quick. Um, If I were to ask you right now, everybody in the room, a pop quiz with one word, describe for me what the role of the devil is in your life. Don't do it right now. Uh, What I think most people would do is they would go, oh Josh, that's actually really easy. The role of the devil is he does temptation. And the devil certainly does that. The devil tempted Job. The devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness. The devil tempted Peter before Jesus went to the cross. What's really interesting is this passage uses a word to describe the role of the devil that is not found anywhere else in the entire Bible. It uses this word. It says that he is the accuser. 
who accuses the brothers day and night. So listen, here's what the Bible's teaching. It's teaching that the devil has two primary schemes in your life. Here they are. Temptation and accusation. And as soon as he succeeds at the first, he moves to the second. Okay? Now listen, what I just said is so important. I'm going to say it again. The Bible says that the devil has two primary strategies for you. Temptation and accusation. And as soon as he can succeed and get you to do something bad, then he moves over to his strategy of accusation. Okay? Uh, when I was in high school, I went to a high school uh, that had a lot of fights. And I was uh, in some of those fights, and I watched some of those fights. Uh, some of those fights went well for me. Some of those fights went really, really bad for me, okay? Uh, but here's what I've learned. In a fight, there's always two extremely pivotal moments, okay? There's one moment where, uh, there's a defining moment where somebody lands the first punch. And usually whoever lands the first punch generally is going to win the fight. Uh, but then later, there's another spot in the fight where if it happens, it turns from, uh, from scary to dangerous, and here's how that works. If somebody lands the first punch and it knocks a guy down, where it turns from scary to dangerous is if he like mounts the guy and then it turns into a ground and pound, okay? Now listen, here's what the devil is gonna do in your life. He's going to tempt you. And if he can get you to do something bad, then that is the point where it can turn from scary to dangerous. He will, ascend, he will mount you, as it were, and turn it into the ground and pound of accusation. That is what he is always trying to do in your life. Now, let me tell you a story to kind of help you understand how this works, and this is kind of personal. Uh, fair warning, I ran this past my pastoral uh, help team, and they were like, Josh, uh, that story makes you look really bad. And so here's my philosophy. If me sharing my struggles can help you feel better about your struggles, then it's worth it to me, okay? So fair warning, this is gonna, it's gonna get, get kind of vulnerable. Um, so here, here's, here's my deal, let me tell you a little bit about my family. Uh, when I'm at home at my church, I preach five services live every Sunday, five. Uh, when I am done preaching, by the way, do not do that to your pastor, all right? Okay, do, don't do that to him. When I finish preaching those five services, I am utterly catatonic. I don't know if this is true. I had a doctor tell me one time that preaching one sermon does to your adrenal glands what running a marathon does to your adrenal glands. So when I'm done preaching five sermons, I am really, really done. So here's what I usually do. Uh, I usually come home to my family, and uh, let me show you my family. This picture I'm getting ready to toss up on the screen is me, my wife, uh, and my, our two precious daughters. The picture I'm getting ready to toss up on the screen is currently my favorite picture of my two girls. Here, here it is. These are my two girls right there. That's them, okay? That's my girls. Yeah, that's them, okay? That's them practicing what we call the stink eye in the Howerton house, and they're doing pretty good, okay? And then this is a picture of my whole family. This is the sweet one right here. That's the fam right there. So Jana and my two girls, two adopted daughters, Eliana and Felicity. Eliana six, Felicity's two. So typically what happens is I come home from preaching the five services, and when I get, I'll be really honest, when I get home from preaching, I just want to eat my feelings, like that's all I wanna do. And usually what I want is I want carbs. Like lots and lots and lots of carbs. By the way, can you all quit with this bread is bad for you foolishness? Can we just, listen, Jesus did not say that he was the broccoli of life. He did not pray, give us this day our daily kale. That's not what he did. Bread is awesome, amen? That's it, bread is amazing. So when I get home, that's what I want. I want lots and lots of carbs. That's what I want. So typically when I get home, what happens is I walk in the door and Jana, my wife Jana is amazing. Usually when I walk in, she's got dinner ready on a plate. I walk in, she hands me dinner and says, babe, how was your day? She lets me have the dinner. I'll walk into my room, they close the door. And then the joke is they do life around me for the rest of the day. Uh, that's usually what happens. Um, but there came a day last year where that's not what happened. Uh, I walked in the house after preaching five and uh, I was just honestly not in a really good emotional spot. And uh, I walked in the door and Jana didn't have dinner ready. And so I just fired off of the mouth. I said, where's my dinner? Okay. And uh, we have a look. Jana's very small and cute, but there's a Shakespeare quote that we attribute to Jana. Though she is small, she be fierce. That's what we say. That's what we say about Jana. So Jana immediately, she kicks into self-defense mode. And she's like, well, let me tell you about my day. This day was hard. The girls are hangry. That's hungry plus angry. Girls are really hangry and they've been bad. Eliana's acting out. We had a bad morning. So she kicked into self-defense mode. And then I just fired off of the mouth again. I said, well, how do you think my day was? 
Uh, and that's when it turned from scary to dangerous. That's, that's what happened right there. And, um, and what happened in that moment is, uh, is something in me snapped. Um, as soon as I started to raise my voice, um, Eliana, our six-year-old, she got scared because daddy was raising his voice. And she started crying and she ran away. And then my two-year-old Felicity, she was hungry, something was going on, so she starts wailing. So what happens is I got Janet yelling at me. I got, five, I got a six-year-old that's crying to run away. I got a two-year-old that's freaking out. I just finished five services. I'm not doing good. And I just snapped. And, uh, and I looked at my family, and I screamed at the top of my voice, why can't everybody just shut up? And, um, and I really wish that I could say I stopped there, uh, but I didn't. And I just kept going, and I kept going. And uh, some really unpastoral words uh, flowed out of my mouth. I had a, a metal butter knife in my hand. And I literally took this metal butter knife and threw it into the sink and scared them all. And I just kept going and going and going. And have you guys ever had this spot where, like, you're really, you, you get into the spot, you snap, and you're really angry at you. But it would be too embarrassing to admit that you're angry at you. So you have to, like, double up on your anger at other people. And that happened to me. And so I'm there, and I'm like, man, internally I'm going, Josh, why do you have to be this way? Why do you have to be so immature? Why are you raging at your precious family? And I just kept going and going and going. And then when I was done, uh, there was this eerie silence. And I heard my six-year-old in our balcony just say, she was whimpering, she was sobbing. And I just heard her say, is daddy done yelling yet? And, uh, and Jana just grabbed me and she was like, Josh, just go to your room, go to your room. You just need some time, you just need some time. And I went in there and closed the door and that's when it started, this voice. And it was, it was like this voice was saying to me, that's who you are. You're the dad who screams at his wife. You're, you've ruined everything with your kids. Your kids are going to grow up hating God. And they're going to grow up hating the church because they had a dad who preached at noon and yelled at two. And you've ruined everything. You'll never be able to unruin everything. Everything is ruined. Now listen, here's how the devil is going to work in your life as an accuser. What he's always trying to do is take what you did and convince you it's who you are. If he can tempt you into doing something wrong then he's going to move to accusation and try to convince you that what you did is who you are. So listen, here's how this is working in some of your lives right now. This is the mom who gives everything she can to her kids every single day as much as she can. And then she has one day where she's a little more busy and doesn't get the quality time she wants. And immediately there's a voice. That's who you are. You're the mom who neglects her kids, convincing you what you did is who you are. Or maybe you're a guy who grew up in a house with an explosive father. And when you were a kid, you promised yourself that you'd never become like your dad. And you do really good. And then you have one day where you raise your voice at your family, and there's that voice. That's who you are. You're just like your dad. You've always been like your dad. You're becoming more like your dad. You'll never be anything except who your dad was. That's who you are. I'll give you one more. This is like, man, some of you in here, you're working with everything you got to like get your life in the right direction and right the ship. And you're doing everything you can to sort of succeed. And then you have one tiny failure and then boom, there's a voice. And the voice says, that's who you are. You're a failure. See, what the devil is always trying to do is when you make a mistake, convince you that what you did is who you are. Okay? Now listen, what you need to know is that that voice is going to be louder at some times and softer at others. There's a group of old dead pastors, guys called the Puritans. And they studied their churches and they started figuring out there were some seasons where his voice intensifies. And they called these seasons, they call them seasons of accusation. And you need to know that's gonna happen. So for instance, there's a few types of seasons of life where he's gonna accuse at a greater level. So for instance, this is gonna happen to you when you're being tempted. When you are tempted, you are going to hear a voice very loud that says, oh man, you screwed up yesterday. You're going to screw up tomorrow. Why does it even matter trying to not screw up today? That's going to be a really loud voice. When you're in a season of pain, you're going to hear a voice inside of your head that says, this is happening because God hates you. That's the accuser's voice. Uh, I'll be really honest. So Jan and I, you know, our two adopted daughters. Uh, Jan and I have what doctors call unexplained infertility, which is exactly what it sounds like it is. We can't have kids, and nobody can tell us why. And so there was a voice that Janet would hear in her head 
once every single month. And here's what the voice said. This is happening because of your mistakes you made in high school. God is punishing you. God hates you. You see that? The accuser's voice, okay? You might be here and you're single. But like you're single in your 30s and 40s. And your singleness feels a lot more like a trial than it does a calling, okay? And you might be in the season. There's, a, there's actually there's a guy in my church who he's single and he's, he's in his 40s. And uh, he just, every time he would come to weddings, all the little old ladies in our church would come find him. They'd pat him on the head. And they'd be like, oh, hey, Brian, you're next. It's okay, you're next. He finally got so fed up with it, he started coming to the funerals, finding those same ladies, patting them on the head. You're next, you're next. It's coming, you know, that kind of thing. And you might be in one of those seasons where it's like you're in a season of pain. And you need to know that in a season of pain, the accuser is going to come with a louder voice. This is because God is punishing you for what you've done. He hates you. I'll give you one last one. Any time that you step forward to represent Christ or to serve in any way, this voice is going to get really loud. Okay, I'll give you an example of this. When I was in college, uh, I made a mistake uh, where I took advantage. I just made a, a morally terrible decision. And I took advantage of somebody that was in my college. And years later, when I went to plant a church in Nashville, Tennessee, I just happened to find out that that person that I had screwed over in college lived three miles away from where I was planting my church. And I found out secondhand that when she heard that I was pastoring a church in the area, I'm going to use some strong language, so track with me. Uh, I found out that when she found out I was pastoring a church, secondhand I heard her response was, who the hell does he think he is? And to shoot you straight, I hear that voice in my head before every single time that I preach. Who the hell do you think you are? And you need to know that when you step forward to serve Christ and be used by him, you're going to hear that voice in my head. Who do you think you are? You pretending to be some man or woman of God. You see, this is seasons of accusation. And the devil is always trying to do this, to take what you did and convince you that it's who you are. Now, here's the question. How do we overcome this? How do we overcome the accusation of the enemy in our life? Now, this passage answers that question. And here's what it says. Look down with me at verse 11. It says, they overcame, they triumphed over him. How? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Okay? Now listen, that's what it says. It says, they overcame by the blood of the lamb. Now listen, I need to take a second. And we've got to understand what the blood of the lamb has actually done for us. And I want to speak to you especially if you're here and you would not call yourself a person of faith. First of all, I just want you to know you have found the perfect church for you. Uh, this is a place, I want you to know this. The people in this room are not here because they think that they are good and awesome and upright and moral people. These are people who are saying, I am not good, I am a forgiven person. You belong here. Listen, that's right. You belong here if you have made mistakes. Here's all generate, here's all our churches are. Here's all we are. We are one big dysfunctional family. That's all we are. And so this church is for you. You belong here. Okay, make this your family. But I want to speak to you if you're that person. And you say, man, I'm not a person of faith. I want you to understand what the blood of Jesus has accomplished for you. Okay. Uh, when I was in seminary, I had a professor who he told this story, supposedly a true story, about two, uh, two guys in Georgia who went out hunting one day. And they go out hunting, and then uh, in the distance, they see smoke rising in the distance. And they kind of make a mental note and go, ah, oh, man, I wonder what that is, and, and they just keep hunting. And then about an hour later, they look up, and they notice, man, that smoke is, is a little closer. And they're like, huh, wonder what that is, and they just keep going. And then about another hour later, they look up, and that smoke is really close, and it dawns on them that it's the smoke from a rapidly approaching forest fire. And they realize that the fire is traveling towards them faster than they can travel towards their car. And so they start freaking out, but there was one guy who had a genius idea. He knelt down, and he opened his pack, and he took out a box of matches. And uh, they walked out into the middle of a big field full of dry hay, and he struck a match and knelt down, and he lit the dry hay in the middle of the field on fire, and he stood back. And the other guy was like, bro, what are you doing? And he's like, wait, just wait. And there was an area that started to burn, and it started to expand and expand, and the burned over place got larger and larger and larger until eventually the already burned over place was so large 
that when the fire came, all they had to do was walk right forward into the already burned over place. And as long as they stood there, that fire could not touch them. Now listen, the cross is the already burned over place. It, that's right. The cross of Jesus is the place where all of God's judgment on sin has already fallen. And anybody who stands in the already burned over place by faith, the, the wrath of God will never touch you. And none of the accusations of the enemy can ever lay a finger on you because you are standing in the already burned over place of the cross. That is what the blood does. Okay. Now here's the question. How do we actually make that an experienced reality in our life? How do we start to walk in the freedom that God has already purchased for us? Did you notice in this passage, this passage, it uses the phrase, they conquered on account of the blood of the lamb. And then, did you notice this passage? It calls the devil the accuser. Uh, if we got any Bible scholars in the room, you may know this. When Revelation 12 calls the devil the accuser, it's actually using a legal term. And it's saying, here's what it's saying. It's saying that the devil is a prosecuting attorney. That's what he is. He's a prosecuting attorney. It's as if in the courtroom of heaven, there is a prosecuting attorney making a case against you all of the time. But listen, there's somebody else in that courtroom, isn't there? Uh, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible is 1 John 2, 21. My little children, I write this to you that you may not sin. But if any one of you does sin, let him know that he has an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, okay? Now listen, I love this so much. Do you know what the word advocate means? That's also a legal term. The word advocate, it means defense attorney. That's what it means. So here's what, here's what heaven is like. It's as if in the courtroom of heaven, every second of every day, whenever I sin, here's what happens. The devil stands up and he says, your honor, Josh Howerton sinned again. And your imperishable word says that sin deserves death. And so I demand that Josh Howerton be punished and condemned for his sin. You must pour out wrath on him. And then in that moment, it's as if from the other side of the courtroom, Jesus stands up and says, objection, your honor. Objection. And then Jesus says, it is true that Josh Howerton just sinned. And it is true that your word says the wages of sin is death, but I have already died that death. And it would be unjust of you to punish the same sin twice. And so your honor, I do not ask for grace and mercy for Josh. I demand justice for my blood. That's what I want for Josh. You must pardon him because he is a blood-bought son of the living God. That is what happens to you. Every single time that you sin, that is what happens. Now listen, here's the question. How do we take what is going on in the courtroom of heaven and bring it down into the courtroom of our hearts and overcome the accusation that happens within us, okay? Did you notice in this passage, why does this passage say that they overcame by the word of their testimony? Why does it use the word testimony? Do you guys know the difference between a biography and a testimony? Your biography is your story with you at the center. Your testimony is your story with Jesus at the center. That's what a testimony is, okay? So here's how you overcome this is you turn your biography into a testimony anytime you're accused. That's how you overcome this. I'll give one example of this. So I'm a, a bit of a, a, a church history nerd. I love reading old dead guys. One of my favorite guys is a guy named Martin Luther. Uh, Martin Luther was a leader of the Protestant Reformation. In fact, the entire reason we are sitting here today is because Martin Luther, uh, 500 years ago, recovered that salvation was by grace alone apart from works, okay? So Martin Luther is one, one of my bros. I love Martin Luther. But Martin Luther, a lot of people when he was alive, they literally thought that Martin Luther was insane because he recounted having visible experiences with the devil. Now listen, some people thought he was insane. I think that Satan was just strategically attacking somebody that was gonna lead to millions of people knowing Christ, okay? So Martin Luther actually recorded some of these experiences he had with the devil in his journal, okay? And, and here's one of them. He recounts a time where the devil appeared to him in his study, and Satan said to Martin Luther, 
how dare you pretend to be a reformer of the church? Let your memory do its duty. You are a liar, greedy, lecherous, a blasphemer, and a hypocrite. Let your reform begin with you. How dare you pretend to be a reformer of the church? So then Martin Luther responded, and he said to the devil, devil, take up that slate that lies on the table just in front of you and write down all the sins with which you have now charged me, and if there be any additional, write them down too. And in his vision, the devil literally did this, took up a pen and started writing every sin that Martin Luther had ever committed. And he wrote and he wrote, and he wrote. And supposedly this went on for hours and hours and hours until eventually the devil was done and he put his pen down. And Martin Luther looked at him and said, now have you written the whole? And he said, yes, and a dark black catalog it is. To which Martin Luther responded, then take up that slate once again and after the last sin you have recorded, write the announcement which I shall repeat to you from 1 John. The blood of Jesus cleanseth from all sin. Do you know what he did in that moment? He turned his biography into a testimony. Listen, when the devil comes into your life as an accuser, he may get the first word, but you ensure he's not going to get the last word. You stand up, and here's what you've got to do. You've got to learn to finish the devil's sermons for him. He gets the first word, you get the last word. I want you to stand to your feet right now, and I want you to learn how to receive this. So for instance... There are some of you in this room right now that when he comes to you and he whispers to you, you'll never do anything great for Christ. You are so weak and unimpressive. Then you finish his sermon and you say, yes, I am weak. And his power is made perfect in weakness, so I'll boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses for when I am weak than he is strong. You finish his sermon. When he comes to you and he says, look at what you've done. You are such a disgusting sinner. Then you finish his sermon and you say, yes. And when you tell me that I am a sinner, you comfort me immeasurably. For my Bible tells me that Christ died for sinners. He came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. And my Bible tells me that my Savior has a nickname. Jesus Christ, the friend of sinners. You finish his sermon. Whenever he comes to you and he whispers to you, you'll never amount to anything. Look where you came from. Then you finish his sermon and you say, yes, yes. And God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame what is wise, and he's chosen what is weak in the world to shame what is strong. I don't do this by myself. I do it with the power of the Spirit that labors mightily within me. And you finish his sermon. And when he comes to you, and he will do this to some of you tonight, and he whispers to you, you are such a flawed mom. You've ruined everything. Then you look back at him and you say, you're right. <laughs> you're right, I am not a perfect parent but I am loved by a perfect parent. I'm not who I wanna be, but I'm also not who I was and I'm becoming who I will be. He's making me more like him every day and I'm being transformed from one degree of glory into the next because the spirit of the living God lives inside of me. Amen, Generation Church. Amen and amen. We have Jesus Christ, our advocate before the throne of God on our behalf. Lift your voices right now. Let's celebrate him. Let's celebrate our advocate and let's praise him. Lift your voices right now. Yeah.